Nice. Nice. How's that for Sneaky Sneak? That was Sneaky Sneak. Well, I'm Father Gregory Pine. And I'm Father Patrick Prisco. And welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all those who support the show. If you would like to tithe to our work, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Now, you'll be happy to hear that for this episode of Lives Planning, we are coming to you partially from Summit, New Jersey. Father Patrick is on the scene. Reporting live for the, for the Dominican <laughs> nuns at Summit, New Jersey. Well, so Father Gregory is teasing me about this camera angle, which I had to use to show the nun's phone. Uh, <laughs> no, that's not the real reason. Because <laughs> it's, it's to show this, this copy. I'm going to sort of lean this way. Of Saint, one of St. Dominic's miracles of this hand. See, there's St. Dominic in the mirror in the middle, nice. performing the miracle, the miraculous uh, multiplication of loaves, feeding the brethren there, they're being served by angels. But this is in the, the guest quarters, this copy of this lovely painting by Fra Angelico, as in the guest quarters, where you could make a retreat. You could call, all, you know, all of our God's planning listeners could come and spend some time with the nuns. So reach out to them at the monastery in Summit, New Jersey. So really fantastic. Okay, but how about we go to the angle that you preferred? How's nice. that? Nice. Nice. Yeah, I was worried there. You know, yeah. I want to afford ample opportunity for people to see my facial imperfections, like the aforementioned bump or the balding, or perhaps the many places in which I nicked myself with a razor in the last four days. So it is <laughs> for this camera hair. angle that I was made. <laughs> nice. Blessed uh, Advent. <clears throat> Blessed Advent. Um, uh, we're not and- here to talk about Dominican nuns or Advent or Frangelico paintings or reporting from on location. We have another topic in store. You want to kick us off? I'd love to. Okay, so this December makes 400 years since the death of St. Francis de Sales, who was not a Dominican, but we are just Catholic enough to like people who aren't Dominicans. <laughs> um, <laughs> like Jesus, for instance. Um, no, it's it's really exciting. Well, yeah, no, it's a good disclaimer. We don't always <laughs> act that way. <laughs> uh, it's exciting because St. Francis de Sales is a saint. He's a doctor of the church. And he's also one of these Christians who, who preaches very vehemently and beautifully about the lay vocation and the universal call to holiness. So, um, yeah, my own experience I, I first picked up the introduction to the devout life from my dad's bookshelf and I read part of it and I was like, this is cool. Also, let me try these meditations. And then like 10 days later, I was like, I think I stink discursive prayer. I think I was put on this planet to fall asleep and to make lists. Um, but then I picked it up recently again and I made it to the end and I was like, holy smokes, this man is wise and he tells some wild stories. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on St. Francis of Sales? Are you a fan? Are you kind of a... Uh, me or you uh, okay so well i have to do some fact checking with you um so so uh, one i have been a lot more interested in francis de sales because i've recently learned that he is a patron of journalists wow which is pretty dope um because and i believe i'm not mistaken <laughs> on this right he was the bishop of geneva which was calvinist at the time and so at one point he was exiled from the city and informed his parishioners, and this is really the reason why he's patron, uh, special patron for Catholic journalists. He continued to inform his people, to shepherd his people, to encourage his people by way of letters, hmm. which he would deliver by ne- secret nighttime trips to the city. Is all that true? So I hadn't heard the last part, but that doesn't mean it's not true. It just means that I don't know it. But I'm mm, pumped cool. about so, it. So uh, let's claim that with an asterisk. <laughs> <laughs> So I this recently is went the case, maybe. <laughs> yes, I, I recently went to the place to which he was exiled. I think I, I think he was actually, you know, from there. So uh, in Annecy, France, spelled A-N-N-E-C-Y, I think. Um, and it's on this beautiful lake. And it's in the French Alps or like the foothills of the French Alps. And they built a basilica in the 20, 20th century. I was about to say 21st century, but that'd be like yesterday in the 20th century. And he is there. So his body is there. And then the body of St. Jane Francis de Chantal, who was the foundress with him of the visitation, which subsequently has spread all over the world. 
Um, and so I was really, you know, we, we had mass at the altar of St. Francis de Sales with his relics across the way from St. James Francis de Chantal. So it's always a good day when you get to spend time in a basilica with two saints. But then like a bunch of other significant things are in that town. So we also visited um, like the first visitation and the second visitation, these, you know, like excellent places. And then we also visited. So I think he was born there because we visited the Dominican church, which has been recovered recently, alas and alack, uh, where he was baptized. Um, so it's like a Dominican church uh, from I think it was made or it was erected in the 14th or 15th century. Uh, but he was baptized there. And then we also visited the house of the Madame de Chamoisy, uh, who is the Philothea to whom he addressed the introduction to devout life. And it was actually like, it was weird. It was that house that I got most giddy about. I was like, guys, this is where she lived. And they were looking at me like, what's your problem? I was like, great question. <laughs> but I'm surprisingly pumped about this. So it was really cool. It was just, I don't know. It's like, sometimes it hits you that Holy people lived here, and I was really getting hit with it as we were bopping from spot to spot to spot. So, St. Francis de Sales. Yes. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. Um, although, I did find a way to slip in some Dominican triumphalism there. What, do you think he was baptized by a Dominican? <laughs> almost certainly. If, that, if baptized in Dominican church, you know, come on. Yeah, almost it's certainly. It's good. Yeah, so... From what I'm from what I'm hearing, the key to sanctity is to be baptized by a Dominican. So, folks, Father Patrick is in Summit, New Jersey, right now. So, bring okay. your kids, and uh, we'll have a grand old baptism, Saint Peter Claver or Saint That's Louis Bertrand style. This is what it looks like. Exactly. <laughs> yep. So, uh, I heard that Saint Peter Claver baptized three hundred thousand. So, F Father Patrick is going for three hundred thousand and one. Um, we can begin that process immediately upon the conclusion of this live splitting. So, okay. let's get to it. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, so our first question today. Uh, so as you know, by the way, I like to shout this out. Um, as people who join us for live signings know that most of our questions come from our Patreon supporters. And that's how we always start. We start with questions from our Patreon supporters. But if something occurs to you, please drop in the chat, you know, share your questions, especially today, we only have a few to start with. So we'll probably get to yours if you drop it in below. Probably. Asterix. <clears throat> okay, so our first question. Paolo writes, I'm originally from Italy, in the Ambro uh, raised in the Ambrosian, right? And when going back, I discovered that two years ago, they tweaked the wording in the Our Father. More specifically, the sentence, do not lead us into temptation. Mm. Uh, they, so they tweaked this into, do not abandon us into temptation. The new wording seems to me to be more theologically correct. What do you think? And is there a chance that the Our Father could be similarly changed in the United States as well? And just curious, who would decide that? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Paula, for the question. Have you followed this, comp this uh, question, Father Gregory? A little bit. Um, I didn't know about the Italian setting. I know about the French setting. So a similar change was done in French about 10 years ago. And the idea is that you want to distance God from like, positive causality when it comes to temptation you don't want to say like god's sending temptations our way as if you know like god is like mickey mouse in fantasia orchestrating a broomstick dance and that broomstick dance is a dance of temptation because yeah it gets weird so the language is changed so as to reflect the fact that god permits it but god doesn't you know like positively will it to use uh language which is, uh, which is also used by St. Francis de Sales, who's celebrating 400 years of death and sanctity. Uh, did we mention that? I think we may have. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think that I, I, it's a little bit bracing for people to have the Our Father changed because it's such a precious prayer, because it makes such a, you know, like significant kind of contribution to our vocal prayer, to our just tradition of worship. So like to have the words altered is uh, a little bit discouraging or maybe even discombobulating. Um, so I think that uh, like a lot of people would push back against it for that reason. But I think like what you said, the language better reflects the theological reality. So if it were to happen, I think it would be the CDW, Congregation for Divine Worship, but it would ultimately be by papal authority and approval. And I know that there are whisperings of it happening in the English language as to whether or not that takes place in the next five, 50 or 500 years. I have no idea. Um, but yes, I have heard of that happening. 
Yeah, and I think it would be interesting to watch those discussions because I, in the English language, um, English speakers tend to be less culturally united. If that makes sense. So questions for the English use in the liturgy are, are, are very interesting for this reason because English is used in such a diversity of countries throughout the world. And the church has actually been pretty intentional of trying to unite English translations uh, mm -hmm. of the mass. So for example, the recent translation, the transition of the third typical edition of the Roman Missal into English, one authoritative edition for English was issued for the whole universal church, which basically made everyone angry. <laughs> so English speakers in England uh, had things to complain about and people in the United States had things to complain about. Um, I really love the new translation. I think it's very beautiful. Um, and was a was a tremendous improvement over uh, the translation I was raised with. Uh, so, so I will I will offer that as some commentary. So I do think that translations can improve our life of prayer. Um, so in the United States, there's a body called ISIL, which sort of percolates these things, and uh, translations are approved by the U.S. bishops, and they're working on some. Like you're going to notice a change in the prayer for absolution, um, which is being introduced on Ash Wednesday, that'll be the first use for this year, and priests will have to use the new formula for absolution by Divine Mercy Sunday this year. So we do tinker with these things and they do offer theological clarity. And as I said, I think the, the, the translation of the missile really, really was beautiful and very successful. So thanks, Paolo, great question. So our next question comes from Odalis. My husband and I are reading The Devout Life with you, huzzah and have been making a little Advent retreat out of the meditations from the beginning chapters. Can you elaborate on what the spiritual nose gay is supposed to be? Uh, that would be great because I don't know. Are these additional prayers we add, things we gleaned from the meditation and chew on all day? A little more clarity would be helpful, she says. Thanks. Odalis is a God's planning champion uh, who made her presence known at the last God's planning all comers retreat to the joy and delight of all present. Um, so we love you, Adalis. right? We have this, <laughs> we do love you, Odalis. We love you in a big way. Um, so yeah, Ascension has this podcast that Father Jacob Bertrand and I are contributing to called Catholic Classics. So we read through the introduction to the Vat Life and gave some commentary on it, like Bible in a year. And in the first part, so there's five parts to the introduction to the Devout Life. In the first part, St. Francis de Sales describes a method of prayer, and basically, it starts with you know, place yourself in the presence of God and ask for his inspiration. And then the second thing is you meditate on some aspect of the faith, like God or something in light of God. And then the third part is you kind of push those meditations through your heart, right? So as to form what are called affections or resolutions. This idea that you kind of want to motivate a response. And you think about here, like Lexio Divina, that stage of prayer, you're kind of formulating your meditations by way of aspiration. You're saying like, mm, give it here. Um, and then the fourth part is what Odalis describes. You kind of wrap things up. You thank God for the graces that he's given. And then you collect what St. Francis de Sales calls a spiritual nosegay or like a little bouquet, a floral edge. Um, and the idea there is that you would just pick some gems from your time in prayer. So let's say, you know, it's, it's easy if we think about this in terms of Lexio Divina. Let's say you're praying with John 1. And let's say that you're thinking about the passage in which our Lord passes by St. John the Baptist and these two disciples, Andrew and an unnamed disciple, thought the beloved disciple. And then they have this whole exchange, and then Andrew comes back to his brother Peter, and he says, we have found the Messiah. And as you're meditating upon it, you're like, wow, he just he was with him for one day, and he knows he's the Messiah. Either he's foolish, or he's, or he's got something going on. And based on the fact that Jesus is Lord, I think he's got something going on. It's like, wow, that certainty, you know? And you might ask the Lord, like, help me to retain something of St. Andrew's certainty. Help me to partake of St. Andrew's certainty. And you might just come back, you know, throughout the course of the day to the thought that we can know, right? When the 21st century says that you can't know, you can return to the witness of St. Andrew and say, nay, nay, we can know. So it might be something along those lines. So it's not so much like a proposition, um, you know, like faith is, and then some technical definition. It's more so like an encounter with the Lord that took a particular shape, depending on what you were thinking about, and then the response that the Lord was motivating. That was very satisfying. I should really read this book. <laughs> <laughs> Got some interesting ideas, this guy. Okay. Uh, another question yeah. from Adalis. <clears throat> Why do we bow our heads at the name of Jesus and not any other of the Holy Trinity? My guess is something about the whole being of, uh, the whole being savior of the world thing. 
I noticed the retreat, you all did a bow for the whole Trinity. Is that a special Dominican thing? Is that an old timey thing that we should all technically be doing, but no one does anymore? Praying for you always at Dallas. Yeah, so uh, in part, it's a special Dominican thing. So Dallas is referencing how um, at our retreats, we pray the Liturgy of the Hours in common. And that means we pray the Liturgy of the Hours, the Divine Office, the way the Dominicans pray them, pray that prayer of the church. And part of our custom is to bow, uh, to do a full, a full bow, you know, at the waist down during uh, the first part of the Gloria Patri. That is specified in Dominican liturgical law. Uh, so that's that's a Dominican thing. It is both old timey and Dominican. However, there is other particular law for the liturgy of the church. Um, and you'll see people keep this custom uh, of just bowing the head at the holy name of Jesus or at the name of Mary in the liturgy. And many places they add uh, for the whole blessed Trinity, you're supposed to bow your head. So, for example, when I was a seminary in Winona, that was the liturgical law of the diocese. And the bishop instructed us in that. Um, but I know that can vary from place to place. Uh, and I know that the tradition has its origins in reverence, as you mentioned in Dallas, to a particular honor for the holy name of Jesus um, and trying to restore uh, dignity to, um, to, to the Savior's name. Any thoughts on that, Father Gregory? Um, well, I think you said it well. Only thing I'll add is, you know, there are also kind of cool, fun customs to discover. It depends on... Uh, yeah, like you said, the liturgical custom of the diocese in which you find yourself. But it's typical that where clerics attend in choir, so for preaching of whatever sort, typically in the context of the sacred liturgy, that they would remove their beretta at the first mention and at the second mention of the holy name of Jesus. At the third mention, they just remove it all together because it begins to become distracting. So, yep, throughout the course of the church's history, there have been like apostles of the holy name of Jesus, particular saints who have sought to cultivate a devotion. In our own Dominican tradition, you have blessed Henry Suso, who uh, is said to have carved the holy name of Jesus on his chest. And then, you know, you think about sort of the great Jesuit letter devotion. <laughs> yes, yeah, he's a wild man. Um, and then you think about St. Ignatius of Loyola and the Society of Jesus' great devotion to the holy name. And then you think about the scriptural testimony, you know, the importance attributed to this protestation that Jesus Christ is Lord and the fact that every knee shall bow, um, you know, on earth, under the earth and in the heavens. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's just a, a kind of tradition of the church that has taken definitive shape over the course of years. Let's turn to Diane's question here. Hi, Father. She says the book of Revelation says a great sign appeared in the sky, a woman clothed with the sun. The moon under her feet and on her, her head, a crown of 12 stars. She was with child and wailed aloud in pain as she labored to give birth. Since labor pains are a consequence of original sin and Mary, who I believe is the, is the person Revelation is describing, was not born with original sin, how can she experience labor pains? Am I interpreting the passage correctly? Jump on that, Father Gregory. I was at, just discussing this actually with someone. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, my first thought is to say, um, so Our Lady would have suffered labored pains by consequence of original sin, but there are some religious traditions which say that she might have suffered labor pains by solidarity with, you know, like our Lord suffering on the cross or by anticipation of it. So like both, like the church hasn't declared one or the other, both have a kind of theological fittingness to them. Another thing is you could do a more, allegorical or spiritual sense read on this because our lady as not only mother of our lord jesus christ mother of the incarnate word is also mother of the church and we speak about how we the church who are the body of christ he is our head we as the body of christ uh, have to fill up what is lacking in the sufferings of christ and insofar as our lady as our mother is the mold into which we are poured to be shaped after the pattern of her son that you know she can be said to experience labor pains as we are brought to term in our Christian perfection. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the, those are both good options, but also you're dealing with the book of Revelation, which is apocalyptic discourse. So I don't think you have to worry about a hyper literal reading of it or be disturbed by any associations of that sort. Yeah, that would be, that would be my, my first comment, given the nature of Di Diane's question. I have to say though, this is one of the places where my very high Mariology comes out and I say, nice. absolutely not, N nothing like labor pains under any circumstances. <laughs> and I love the old tradition that says that Christ's birth was as 
light passing through glass. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I, I would t- I would tend to a more I would tend to a more tr- traditional point um, to underscore uh, as the tradition does the Virgin Mary's preservation from all sin and from yeah. thereby all the effects of sin. Related question, Father Patrick. This was the first yeah, question please. in our first exam in sacraments class. Do you think the Blessed Mother was <laughs> baptized or not? Oh yeah, so good. Uh, definitely not. No, no okay. need for it. And Christ, Christ, you know, Christ was only baptized so as to purify the waters for us. Uh, the Virgin Mary wouldn't wouldn't need to do anything except um, by by being baptized by way of example for us. But that's just like the least interesting point of causality for me. Like by way of example. Oh, you mean so it doesn't really do anything? Oh, well then we don't need that. You know, so get rid of it. <laughs> That would, that would be my, uh, my response to that exam, you know, and a response that I stand by. That's fun. I didn't think we'd be talking about that today. Yeah, because why not? Glass from the past, a little time machine. Uh, let's jump into some things that some people are saying, you know, as they've tuned in here. Hi, Haley. We just want to say hey. <laughs> Haley Luya. I, lo- I Really, I just wanted to give that name a shout out. She's a champion. Uh, she is present in many, many Catholic live streams. Is she really? Oh, thanks. Yeah. Nice. Uh, we got someone here saying, I can't imagine anyone not loving St. Francis. Okay, feeling a little attacked by that because I didn't know whether or not I loved him at the start of this episode, but I'm moving in the direction of love. <clears throat> Ryan says hello. Charles says hello. Good surprise seeing you. Yes, but even better surprise, Charles, is seeing this. <laughs> Telephone. <laughs> Look at that mural. Just, you know, just to give another shout out to the Dominican nuns in Summit, New Jersey, where I'm hanging out this week, um, broadcasting from their lovely guest quarters where any of you could make a retreat. So, you know, just got to plug our dear sisters. We get a yo from Jeremy. Ryan says he's even reading St. Francis de Sales. Check that out currently. Well, technically, Ryan, you're currently watching a live explaining episode. (laughs) Savage. Okay, so with that, we'll get we'll get back to some questions here. Recently, when praying morning prayer, the line in the invitatory, today, listen to the voice of the Lord, do not grow stubborn as your fathers did in the wilderness, struck me. And I wondered how well or poorly I follow that admission. My question is, what does the voice of the Lord sound like? What suggestions do you have for those of us living in the world to help us listen to the Lord? I want to know what the voice of the Lord sounds like so that I can be alert and able to listen. Thanks for all you do. I'm calling. Yeah, man, me too. <laughs> um, so I was thinking, I was discussing this recently with Father Joseph Anthony, actually. Um, I drove up to the monastery super late on Sunday night, and I was like, you know who will be up? <laughs> Joseph Anthony, because <laughs> he just finished celebrating a mass for students. It's true. It's like, you know, midnight, midnight 30, and we're in the car chatting. And we were actually talking about this question because it was raised in a book that we love called um, From Christendom to Apostolic Mission, uh, which is written by Monsignor Shea and some of his pals at the University of Mary. It's a really fantastic work and something just worth thinking about in our present state if you're not yet familiar with it. So um, From Christendom to Apostolic Mission. Anyway, Monsignor Shea's Uh, point in the book is that it's actually easier to be a priest in the apostolic age. So in the Christendom age, it's more difficult to be a priest because you have to be worthy of being a priest. But in the apostolic age, basically everything has gone to H-E double hockey sticks and you just be a priest and you you know, you're, 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 you're by posture contramundum. It is harder to be a lay person in the apostolic age than it is to be a priest. That's one of, one of the things, that's not the main argument of the book, but that's one of the things he says. And I think I agree with that because um, the lay person can't live contra mundum the same way that a priest can today. Like <laughs> Father Gregory and Father Joseph Anthony and I, we can all just sort of say like, well, that's, uh, that's too bad out there and <laughs> go to our cells at night. Um, obviously we're very interested in the out there because that's the whole point of God's planning is injecting contemplation into the out there. But, uh, but, but, but there's a certain tension there that I agree with. Um, and so the point that I, that I, the reason why I narrate this long story is to tell you that I think it is more difficult as a layperson to hear the voice of the Lord in the world today than it was 
in an age when Christendom was more prominent. I think that's true. Um, and I don't think that's just like wistful longing for past ages. Um, I think that's, that, that's our present reality. It's interesting that you describe that as a long story because <clears throat> on my length meter that would come in as a short story. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, I love being on Lexio Katie episodes Parker with you. Is roasting me for throwing my head back <laughs> like this right now. <laughs> oh no, I was saying I love being on Lexio <laughs> Davina episodes with you because you know I'm trying my best, and by my best, I mean I'm not trying at all. And I'm just like, and now I'm going to say my 18th point, and you're over there like, you know what? I'm just humble enough to adjust for this guy's bombacity. So I have one quick thing to say. It's great, thank you. But, yeah. <laughs> Everyone thanks you. The whole freaking world thanks you. Um, when it comes to hearing the voice of the Lord, my initial thought is that, um, yeah, like this idea of recollection has a really precious gift or precious tradition of, uh, yeah, the Christian heritage. This idea that we are made to have, have a conversation with God about God. Um, and that it's only by virtue of the fall that we have this conversation with ourselves about ourselves. And that part of the excitement of the life of grace is that we're kind of recovering uh, or we're kind of turning back to this conversation with God about God. And it requires some work, right? But that the fruits of that conversation are just a kind of greater givenness to the Lord and a givenness to those whom he has entrusted to us and even to our daily affairs because we don't feel so much divided, dispersed, dissipated, whatever you want to say. Uh, we feel more so kind of like in him as he is in us. So I would say seek to punctuate your day by small little prayers. They don't have to be long, but close your eyes, think of Jesus, or close your eyes and say his name, and then seek to you know, just cultivate that as a habit of framing whatever it is that you're doing or coming from or going to uh, with his presence. Nice. I love that. Um, but I, I think that this is the, to, to get to the last part of the question, You know, how is it that we know what the voice of the Lord sounds like. Um, I think one of the things that happens in Christian prayer when we're faithful to it is a growing confidence. Um, I remember a, a time recently where the Lord told me to do something in prayer and I brought it up to uh, my confessor and he teased me very gently, uh, affirming like, yeah, no, that, that's, that's actually what it sounds like. Uh, so, so we do this, we do this kind of testing, probing, and I think each of us want, wanting to be sure of the authenticity of the Lord's voice, but but gradually you just become more accustomed to it, and you you be you begin to expect the sorts of things that 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 Jesus will um, will speak into your heart. And all of that, that sounds like crazy talk if you're not a Christian, not living the life of prayer. You know, you just say out on the street like, "Oh, I talk to God." Uh, okay, you know, out of context, that sounds really unbelievable. Um, but this is the kind of intimacy with which the Lord actually longs to speak with us. Um, it's not as if he's trying to make his voice difficult to be heard. Uh, we're the ones that complicate things. So here's a, here's a question um, from a user, a uh, YouTube user, who I think we've already said hello to. Oh, yes, because uh, I was accused of not loving St. Francis de Sales. Uh, <laughs> when only I do not know him, and we know that you have to know someone in order to love them. Mm. You tell us that we are. Okay, yeah, okay, here we are. Was Mary created sinless into original justice like Adam and Eve and then brought into the fullness of redemption through Christ's sacrifice? Or was she conceived into the full redemption of Christ? That's fun. I would say you would enjoy Father Joseph <laughs> Anthony's recent episode on the Immaculate Conception. His idea, we did this in honor of our patroness. Um, Father Greg, you want to jump in on this first? Sure. Um so after the fall, everyone is saved by the grace of Christ. Most of us are liberated from that sin. The Blessed Virgin Mary is preserved from that sin. Um, so we, she, she partakes of the grace of Christ in most excellent fashion. Uh, but whereas we say of Christ that he uh, was begotten or he was conceived with a quasi-infinite grace and did not stand to grow in grace, the Blessed Virgin Mary does grow in grace. So she is preserved from sin by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. She does not contract original sin. She does, by solidarity with her son and with sinful humanity, 
can track some of the defects associated with that sin. So like hunger, thirst, suffering, and depending on your religious tradition, whether East or West, death. Father Patrick and his high Christology will clap back at me in short order. Um, but she, she is able to grow in grace. And so she will grow in grace as a fruit of her participation in the mysteries of the life of Christ. Um, and she'll continue to grow in grace up until the end of her life. So Reginald Gary Goulagrange says that she is like a meteorite hurtling towards the surface of the earth that never hits terminal velocity. So she just keeps, keeps picking up grace speed over the course of her life. Um, so yes, there are certain parallels with original justice, and then there are certain parallels with redemption, but her status among the saints is distinct. She didn't die, right? You yeah. She died. Oh, no way. <laughs> Please. How dare, how dare you? How kind of live do I look like? Um, so, so I, th I think too, part of me, part of what I'm, what I'm detecting in the background of this question is, is a question of time. Uh, and sorry, friends, am I back? I can hear you. I, you're not moving, but you sound great. Ooh, now you're moving a little bit. In the absence of Father Patrick's video and audio, I will regale you with stories of Father Patrick. I will only sing his glories. I will not sing any of his non-glories, uh, for I know no non-glories to be sung. Exciting. Sorry, folks. There you are. You're back. Yeah, perfect. Maybe. I was just boasting of you. Ah, uh, yes. Not yet wholly back. Oh, he's thinking. His video is thinking. Um, so let's see. Things that Father Patrick has done over the course of the past 12 years in the context of our Dominican life. Well, in the novitiate, we have a novice, we had a novice master. He still remains our novice master forever and a day. His name is Father James Sullivan, who's an excellent man, whose publications you will sometimes see in Magnificat. Um, but I was mostly overawed by Father James Sullivan. Um, I use the word overawed so as not to use the word scared. Um, and so I think during the novitiate, I may have said, I don't know, 27 words, 28 words. But Father, Father Patrick... Uh, immediately gained the trust of Father James Sullivan. Oh, Father Patrick is texting us. Yep. None Wi-Fi trying to jump back in. I'll continue to tell stories. Father Patrick uh, is a kindred spirit of Father James Sullivan. Father James Sullivan immediately trusted him. And he immediately trusted him with the responsibility of like redecorating our rec room, which at that point was not much to be, uh, not much to be seen, not much to be experienced. But uh, Father Patrick decorated it to perfection in a way that uh, I think still accommodates novices who enter the order in, oh, there he goes. Father Patrick continues to text me and I continue to say things. Um, it continues to welcome the novices to uh, our novitiate in Cincinnati at St. Gertrude's Parish. Um, other things that are to be said of Father Patrick. Father Patrick actually launched one of our first uh, kind of like media projects while in the student tape. I am not an ideas man. I am a plug and chug man. So if other people have good ideas and they say, hey, will you do this thing? I can do this thing. But I will not come up with the idea myself because I'm too busy worrying about life. Um, but Father Patrick was the first one to come up with a video project. So we had a video project, which was called, um, gosh, it was like a kind of like walk through the catechism. And we had different brothers give different lectures. Man, I look back at some of those things. That's like nine years ago. Woof. Uh, so the video and audio quality was not premiere. But the concept itself was sweet, as testified to by the fact that Ascension has launched the Catechism in a Year podcast, inspired by... No, it has no relation to. Just kidding. Um, so, <clears throat> I uh, could continue to tell stories about Father Patrick, but I fear that he might go back and watch this live stream and then... Um, yeah, be embarrassed potentially, or I don't know, gratify. It's hard to say. So I'm going to shift now into our central theme, which is uh, St. Francis de Sales at 400 years. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that. And then I'm going to start answering questions. Uh, so one further thing to say about Francis de Sales uh, with respect to the introduction of the devout life uh, is this. So he thinks that you have two principal kind of uh, means or helps to growth and sanctity which he describes in the first two books, which are prayer and sacrament. 
And so he goes through like a kind of method of prayer. It's a very modest method of prayer. It's not something that needs to be over systematized. And then he describes the way in which you would make preparation for like a general confession as you endeavor to live a devout life and with renewed vigor and with renewed desire. Um, and then speaks about our reception of Holy Communion in the context of, you know, the Eucharistic liturgy, uh, which is really beautiful. And then from there, he goes on to describe the various virtues that one ought to cultivate in the context of the devout life. And then like the temptations or snares that could keep you from living it well. And then ultimately, like how you go about seeking to fuel the fire of this devout life over the course of, yeah, your whole Christian existence. So it's a beautiful thing. So if you haven't yet, do check out Catholic Classics with Father Jacob Bertrand and I recorded for Ascension. So we'll have, uh, you know, maybe like one or two or three seasons a year, we'll read Catholic Classics, which is to say Classics of Catholic Spirituality. The Introduction to the Devout Life is our first one. Our second one is, uh, I can't say. So I'll let you know as soon as I can say. But there is a second one planned. Um, so stay tuned. But don't stay tuned with too much attention because if you try to pay attention for too long, it can actually be uh, like fatiguing. So maybe don't pay attention now and then start paying attention again in like three months. All right, I'm going to switch back to questions. <clears throat> dum, 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 whoa. All right, here we go. Sarah February says, Summit Rosary Shine, hooray. Exactly. Uh, she says, Third Order Dominican here. Cheers to you, Sarah February. Raymond Snodgrass. Raymond Snodgrass is a seminarian for the Ordinariate, which is to say uh, the Ordinariate of the Chair of Peter, which is like the Anglican use of the Mass. Oh, and here's Father Patrick, and he is, oh, I tried to add him to the stream, but he added himself to the stream, and so we canceled each other out. Incredible! <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys, I'm so no, sorry. None Wi-Fi, you know? Yeah. Uh, I was, I was actually, I, I took the opportunity to sing your the, praises. Oh, well, that's nice of you. They don't use the internet the way that we do, so God bless them for yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> best that this way. This could I told very this. possibly happen again. <laughs> we're, we're ready. We're prepared. I was saying how in the novitiate, most of us were just overawed by Father James Sullivan. That's not true of Father Bonaventure, because I don't know that he's overawed by any creature except for like bearded dragons. Mm -hmm. But I said that you weren't. And as a result of which, he trusted you with acquiring things for the novitiate, like the decoration or like the appurtenances for a rec room. And then I was saying how you launched the uh, there it is. Beautiful, beautiful image there. How you launched a catechism in a year before it was a thing when you did that. Um, <clears throat> that like video series that was, I think that was like our first media apostolate thing when you did that catechism based video series, like a billion oh, yeah. years ago. Remember wow. That? With Dominicana. Oh gosh. Those yeah. are probably still on the internet. That's a scary thought. <laughs> <laughs> mm. That's some, that's some oldie timey evangelization right there. That's like stagecoach riding. Mm. Yeah. No kidding. So, who was present on two God's planning retreats. Uh, says, Advent blessings to you, fathers, and to you as well, Raymond. What are some things you've grown to love over the course of your priesthood as it relates to being a priest? Um, Father Patrick, you are presently frozen, and now you are loading. But if you had heard Raymond Snodgrass's question, insofar as it's displayed on your screen, do you have a thought on this? I did hear Raymond's question. And again, <laughs> sorry, everybody, because this is, <laughs> speaking of the Wild West and stagecoachy, I thought this was going to be exciting, and it's definitely turned into being very exciting. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I have been so moved by that I didn't expect um, is to love penitence as much as I do. Um, like there, there's a way there's a way in which you think that hearing confessions is going to go. And then when you actually hear confessions, it is astonishing. I mean, I, I, I really I, people are so, I think, afraid of the priest judging them in the confessional. And I, on the other hand, am just so moved by the way that God works in people's lives, that that is not at all my experience uh, as the priest. So I would say, uh, to Raymond, to answer your question, is that as a priest, hearing confessions, um, you, you acquire really a spiritual bond. And this is where the fatherhood of the priesthood comes in. Um, you're, you're really joined with penitence in a special way in the confessional. Um, in my experience... I was thinking about this recently. I love preaching and teaching, but they are different acts. And I think one of the ways that they're different is when you're teaching, you kind of are shooting for 100% comprehension. But when you are preaching, I think you're shooting for something else. I think you're trying to communicate something of your relationship with the Lord, not in a like, look at me kind of way. Like now I'm going to tell a bunch of personal stories where I sound like a hero. But in the sense that like, 
you're looking to the Lord and you're like, holy smokes, how do I communicate something of the fact that you are as awesome as you in fact are? And then you turn to the congregation, you're like, ah, I'm going to communicate this in whatever way I can. Um, and it's, it's just, it doesn't often result in 100% comprehension is my experience. I mean, I say weird words, but that's besides the point, because often it's just like, when I get into preaching, I won't do this, in fact, but it just kind of, it, it, it presents like this, where it's like, ah! um, and I think that, yeah, it's just such a gift to have something to communicate, and then to have the grace of communication that's supplied by orders. So it's not, it's, it's not that it like floats free of your personality, it's deeply integrated with your personality. But this idea of like, looking on the face of God, experiencing something of the transfiguration with which comes from that vision, and then being able then to turn to the people and being like, holy smokes, <laughs> there's something going on. Uh, yeah, it's just such a gift. Boom. Ryan Markey, are you speaking in Belfast? Nope, I'm waiting on an email from the organizer, but I've been waiting for about two months, so I'm beginning to think it won't happen. My sincere apologies. Hallelujah says, also, my friend met you at Father Pine in London and said you denied knowing my existence. If that is the case, I am sincerely, I am sincerely sorry. But something tells me that your name isn't Holly, Hallelujah. So I don't know that I would have the foreknowledge to recognize you by name unless you share it in some way. So you can email godsplaining at opeast.org. Send me secretly your name. And the next time I have the opportunity to recognize you by name with your friends, I will do so gladly. Hello, fathers. I noticed you discuss films on God's planning that contain sexual scenes, Thin Red Line, Fargo, etc. I was wondering why you think these are okay to view. Also, what is the morality of making actors who are not married perform such scenes? Thank you for your time. Great question. You want to start? You want me to? Uh, Fargo, wood chipper. That's really all I have to say. Yeah. That's my... My, my defense of Argo. No, um, J Jack is here asking a great question. And part of it is that I, that I think we, we have to recognize um, certainly the way that things impact individuals. Um, you know, recovering alcoholics don't go to bars. If sexual temptation is something that you know you struggle with, then the, then the difference that that makes in your spiritual life is going, is going to vary for you. Um, apart from how, how, uh, how other people would receive that. So I think that, that any kind of genuine response to this question has to, has to include um, a, 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 an element of subjective realism that we have to say, because, because of my past, because of my experiences, like, things impact me differently. Um, so that's not, a, that's not a direct answer, Jack, but I, I do think that's the, that's the beginning of something, to say that, well, Part of what part of what we're dealing with here is uh, is is on a scale. So, Father Greg, do you want to pick it up from there? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a good question, and I am sensitive to sexual content when it comes to film, and so my typical move is just not to watch it or to skip those particular scenes. Um, and I suppose that, like, when we do film episodes, we could make that um, what do you call that? Like caution or e yeah, there could be a little bit of a disclaimer. Yeah. yeah, disclaimer. That's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. Um, I think that, yeah, I'm in the I'm in the habit of watching movies and pre previous to watching the movie, I look at IMDb and I look at the rating and then I look at the rating um, kind of citations or the reason for which it's rated as it is. And then I make a judgment as to whether or not it's watchable. And if watchable, then, you know, when the scene comes up, you kind of just deal with them in stride. But my general sensibility is that, um, yeah, this is like also part of what it means to be in the world and not of it. I think it's good to kind of like limit your intake or uh, to limit your access to movies, which can be potentially destructive to your interior life. Um, but I think there are a variety of criteria for that. So for instance, I no longer watch Marvel movies and I no longer watch Disney movies, but that's more of like a kind of, I like the last ones that I watched annoyed me. Like the Marvel movies, I got the distinct impression that they didn't give a rip about story integrity and they were just trying to take my money. And also that they were starting to push an agenda with which I was not comfortable. And then a similar thing with Disney. So it's like, you're, you're making moral judgments of a pretty broad ranging nature when you engage with film. Um, and yeah, I think, that, I think that sexual content is a, is a big ticket item to take account of, especially for men. I was thinking about this actually because I'm coming back to DC and um, the Shakespeare Theater Company has it such that you can get rush tickets for really inexpensive. You can just call them on the day of and get four tickets for zero dollars if you're under 35 years old, which I will be for like another five seconds. 
Um, and the last two Shakespeare Theater Company productions that I went to see were unwatchable for sexual reasons or for blasphemous reasons. And I was like condoling with myself the other day thinking like, I don't think I can go to that theater anymore. You know, it's just it's just a shame. It's just what it is. But yeah, Jack brings up a good point. And I think it's part of our prudence that we have to take into account the pertinent factors and then make a decision as to whether a thing can be watched and whether it can be watched well. Boom. JSC Video Productions. Why cannot the Our Father simply be translated from Latin? Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name, etc. <clears throat> Dude, translations. Tricky, mctrickitude. So yep. the Our Father was probably said in Aramaic. It was first transcribed in Greek. It was part of the liturgy, I imagine, in Greek before it was part of the liturgy in Latin. And then it's been translated into, I don't know, like 250 different vernaculars. So translation is always tricky because there are historical contingent factors and then there are more like kind of principled and speculative factors. It's just it's just always a nightmare. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think that Tchadwe uh, say Tchadwe, right? That's that's the that's the saying, um, and I think that it's true. I think that uh, to translate something involves a certain a certain kind of betrayal of the original ideas, and that doesn't mean we lose their entire integrity, but it does mean that that we have to be careful and open and always uh, ready to refine that. We have to recognize that we're we're embarking on an imperfect process. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, that that I that I agree that to to change something by translation to translate speech that was once said in one language to another means that you w you will change it, and so to be attentive to what it is that what it is that that means. Um, regarding the regarding the point about Latin, there is you know that there is a a value in something to be said for the church's universal language, and I think that's worth that's worth bringing to bear on your question. Um, that by by coming to our common language to our lingua franca in the church um, we can we can avoid some of that but if we use exclusively that then some of the questions about the nature of meetings um, can elude us like if, for example i stand by the questions that were asked when we were discussing the our father that was interesting and it's important theologically for our for our reflection yeah i that was a random thought was it? but yeah yeah Father Vincent McNabb, a Dominican of the English province of the early 20th century and friend of G.K. Chesterton, wrote a little commentary on the, on, on the Our Father. And he observes the fact that, you know, there are seven indications of the Our Father, which traditionally are associated with the seven virtues, uh, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, and <clears throat> seven of the eight Beatitudes. Um, but that the first three invocations, like the first half of the Our Father, use the subjunctive mood. And then the lattermost four use the indicative mood. Um, yeah, just like fascinating linguistic things that when you pay attention to the language, uh, you can detect, I don't know, more subtle meanings. So maybe maybe it's not all bad when you translate things because you're also trying to accommodate. And insofar as accommodation is a way of trying to promote recognition and reception, it's a cool exercise. I mean, our Lord accommodates himself to our recognition and reception in the incarnation. So we've got uh, <laughs> good cause. Okay. Charles Busby says, fathers, just an FYI, December 21st, the star of Bethlehem will appear at nightfall for the first time since the 1200s. That's awesome. That's actually really awesome. Um, I have to do some research. Yeah, no kidding. I'm, yeah. I'm very curious what this means exactly. <laughs> Party on. Okay. Dang. And then Sarah February says, the sisters there have very slow internet. Laugh out loud. I work in their gift shop. Incredible. The world is small. Um, all right, folks, that's our last question. Father, Father Patrick, anything cool that you're doing this Advent season that you want to highlight important work that should be followed at OSV? Um, if you're looking for something to get you through the last days of Advent, I've got an ad daily Advent devotional called my daily visitor. Huh? How about that? The daily companion to our Sunday visitor in the newspaper I write for. So yeah, we, we really, we really went crazy with that brand. But, um, but check it out. It's just real quick uh, daily meditations. Um, so if you're still looking for something. Uh, I'm really excited about some of our coming Christmas content on the website. Go over to OurSundayVisitor.com and check us out. Uh, we've got some lovely, lovely pieces coming for these holy days. That's kind of been my world publishing lately, Father Gregory. Yeah. That's right. And if you haven't yet, check out Catholic Classics 
with Father Jacob Burchard and myself. We're reading Introduction to the Devout Life by the aforementioned St. Francis de Sales in like 25-minute installments. So there's, I think, 43 total episodes, and you can start and stop when you see fit to start and stop. It's a digital age. Um, I was about to make a joke about the song Material Girl, but then I stopped myself. Um, also, Father Patrick and I and Father Joseph Anthony are looking forward to hanging out with you, potentially, at Seek in St. Louis, January 2nd through 6th. So we'll be there um, in our booth or not, depending on the hour, and we will be dealing in high fives and encouragement and common life. So, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you there. Sure. And uh, if not, we'll look forward to seeing you at the next opportunity. Um, so know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us, and we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on God's Planning.